the best way to share hope uh, that I know of is through music because music is the 18 inches from the head to the heart and music goes directly to the heart. I'm Shirley May Springer Staten in Anchorage, Alaska and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. So, Shirley May Springer State from well, not from Alaska. No. You're a transplant. Yes. So I want to know, in a minute I want to know, where. tell me now, where are you from originally and what are you doing in Alaska now? I was born in New York, in Harlem. I was raised by my grandmother in rural Georgia. I have been in Alaska. I actually started coming to Alaska in 1979. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And I would come to uh, Fairbanks in the summer. And then uh, summer of 1980, I decided I would come to Fairbanks, go back to L.A., come to Fairbanks. I did that twice. And then in 1981, I decided to come to Anchorage, and I actually fell in love flying over the mountains. And I knew that I wanted to be here. So I've been here since... uh, in Anchorage since 1979. I just flew over those mountains a few hours ago. And it's, it's gorgeous. Unbelievable. I know. I know. Yeah, it's. If you've never seen snowy mountains, it's it's like um, it's like what you see in a movie, and, and it's just perfect and white and black little spots all over them, and they're just white, white and black, perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, and this beautiful blue skies up here in the clouds. I mean, it's just it's perfect, you know, and cold. Actually, it's warm right now. It's springtime. It's not cold. cold. in Fairbanks. Yeah, it gets cold here, too. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Question number one for you, then. Give me a definition of hope. So how would you define hope, or what, what is your understanding of hope in your life? Hope is feeling joyful about your life. Hope is feeling inspired and encouraged about your life. And not only my life, but the people who are in my life. Um, When I wake up in the morning and I am able to take breath, I am joyful because the other option is not taking breath. And so uh, I, I feel joyous about that, about having that experience. Um, and certainly over uh, the years, I've not felt that always. And so there is a greater appreciation for feeling uh, encouraged and uh, blissful about my life. When I'm in a place that things are happening um, to me, that things are happening around me, it feels good just to be alive. I remember um, watching something about a group of people that were in a um, camp in uh, Africa and um, they were so despair about their life. There, there was no hope at all. And then uh, Samatea, who is a musician, just bought his African piano and that brought hope to people's lives. When you can sing a song, Mm -hmm. it changed the energy of who you are. Mm -hmm. And so that's hopeful. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, it really is. It really is. I didn't didn't sing 
or have a song in my heart for uh, I, I really say a couple of decades mm -hmm. until until early last year mm -hmm. maybe maybe six months ago eight months ago so but then all of a sudden it started happening and then mm -hmm. you feel it you know mm -hmm. so Shirley question two is who's shared the most hope with you who's given you a lot of hope in your life and and really given you um, a path to run on so when I think about hope and the answer that I gave before those answers have been manifested by me um, in my family I grew up with my grandparents in rural Georgia in a time that uh, um, we were separated by the railroad tracks, whites on one side and blacks on the other. And so, um, so I don't know if I saw a lot of hope growing up because people were struggling to survive. You know, we, we had to pick cotton, we had to work in tobacco, and it was intense and it was hard and um, to make ends meet. But if I look at my life after that period, I would say um, um, teachers, um, uh, Miss Harding, who was my professor at Anchorage Community College in, not Anchorage, it was uh, San Diego, who said, this is possible for you. When I joined VISTA, Volunteers in Service to America, in 1965, I was one of the most, one of the first volunteers, it was 20 that were sent out. Wow. And uh, this Jewish man, Mr. Rubenstein, said, you have something to give. And he gave me this application to, um, to complete. And I ended up in Mount Angel, Oregon. I was only 19, working with migrant workers. And then ended up in New Mexico, working in community development. So Mr. Rubenstein would be one of those um, individuals that said this is what life can be for you and in a way when I think about it in retrospect this is what hope looks like uh, and those benchmarks of individuals along the way mostly teachers and you know some friends that said uh, here, this is a key uh, for you, and uh, and they have been that you know foundation to open up that window. And I'm using hope now, paralleling with possibilities for my life. It's a powerful story. So, going going back to childhood. So, from Harlem, then living in in pre in pre Martin Luther King Jr. Georgia, for lack of a better way to say it, mm -hmm. uh, that name's so recognizable around the globe. Just so much um, division, purely based on the color of skin mm -hmm. and and a lot of horrible past. Mm -hmm. um, but all that was based on color of skin and who the has and the has nots, you know. Right. Um, right. So what a unique perspective. I can't wait to ask you more of these questions because you've got a perspective that few people can have just because you have to, you have to live it to know it, you know, and nobody would want to choose to take that book and read it, that life book off the shelf. But once you've taken that book off the shelf and read it, you, you have wisdom and things to share with other people that, that they might not have on their own. Right. Hmm. Thank you. Shirley, question three. 
take us back to a time when you're when you're going to you know have gone through that time you've already hinted at that a little bit but you've gone through times when when hope has been something hard to find um, because the days get dark and they get long and you may or may not have the, the support group behind you that you need whatever it may be I, I don't know it's your story not mine but um, help us understand where your life has come from so we can really learn from, from what's gone on back there okay this year I will turn 69 and so I have a longer period to reflect upon in terms of challenges that I've had over the years um, but the one that's present was last year when I turned 68. And it probably had been happening for a year, but I couldn't pinpoint why I was so dis depressed and why I felt so hopeless about my life. Mm. And actually the day that I turned 68 was I could name what was happening. For months I was feeling hopeless about my own life. And so what it looked like um, I was transitioning into maybe new work, but I didn't know what it was. I have been single for 30, 35 years. Um, my son is now, uh, he's going to be 42 this year. Um, I've had challenges. Um, with reading and uh, dyslexia. Mm -hmm. And so all of it was beaming down on me in a concentrated period of time to the point when I would wake up in the morning, I couldn't breathe because I felt so hopeless about my life. And it was all of those things. Um, I used to say, and I still say, that when, um, well, maybe I don't say it so much now, but <laughs> when, when I get dep depressed, I put everything in the pot. Yeah. Every possible <laughs> mishap, uh, anything anybody said to me, did to me, any... Uh, acts of unkindness it all goes in there mm -hmm. and then I can just obsess mm -hmm. about it and so this was so intense January, February, March, April uh, at some points I couldn't get out of the bed and but I couldn't also if you had called me and said so what's wrong I couldn't name it and I didn't want to talk to anybody about it because nobody cared uh, that I was feeling this despair about my life and feeling invalidated, not mm -hmm. validated, and the list went on. And then finally, uh, a friend came over and uh, we just start talking about it. And she was feeling the same. Hmm. And to this day, I, I still, it could have been a chemical uh, imbalance, but in my 68 years, I had never felt that way hmm. about myself and my life, even through my divorce. And through my divorce, I was pretty hopeless. Mm -hmm. But I managed to spin out of it and come back. But this was different. This, I couldn't get a grip 
mm-hmm. on what was wrong. It's like I'd fallen through a crevasse and I couldn't find a way to pull myself up. And so this friend came over and we talked about it. And this is so ironic that I had my birthday and I immediately felt better. Really? Yes. I immediately felt better. And so I don't know, and I love, I love 68. I love 60, I love 65. I love all of my ages, and I am so grateful for all of them, as I said before. But for whatever reasons, um, it was the darkest of the darkest period in my life. And it lasted January, February, March, April, May. So this friend that was... They came over. How long after you started talking to the friend was it before you started getting better? Maybe a couple weeks. Okay. Yeah. Because I was, I felt isolated in this feeling Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and not really wanting to reach out because I couldn't explain it. Uh, I couldn't explain it until I turned 68 and I realized I felt hopeless about my own life. And when one feels hopeless about their own lives is when they commit suicide. Yep. When they feel hopeless, and I was so close mm. um, to, I thank God I didn't have a gun mm-hmm. because I was so close. And I, I understood that people said, well, I don't know why somebody would commit suicide. Yeah, I, I do. I, I do. I understand why uh, people are driven to that place. And it's because they don't have hope for their own lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's powerful because because it's um, it's kind of catches people off guard when they have some people are kind of wired and have an internal an internal hope, I guess. I don't know what it is, but some people are just more optimistic, whatever you want to call it, and they don't naturally get down and depressed or or even some people who've had some horrible things happen to them. For some reason, it didn't strike them as a horrible thing. You know? Um, but but when, it, when it does catch up to you, um, it kind of turns your world upside down. And you, again, going and finding somebody and being vulnerable enough to say, here's what I'm feeling. What in the world is this? Mm-hmm. That's so scary because you think somebody's going to say, I think you're going crazy. Mm-hmm. Or yeah. you're not suited to do your job anymore. Or you're not going to be a good neighbor, spouse, you know, whatever relationship. But wow, once you get it out there, you realize somebody else can really care for you and help. Right, 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 right. You're sharing hope with people and you're growing hope in your own life. So tell me for question number four, how are you doing that? What's going on in your life personally or around your community? How are you growing in or sharing hope with others? And, and I'm going to interrupt you here because yeah. this in on the, uh, on the interview. So if you're listening, you didn't, you didn't quite hear all these backstage comments, but you say you think that saying thank you is, is super important. You really value that. And you've you've learned how to say thank you in a couple of different languages? Yes. Maybe more than a couple? Yes. So, um, I'd love to hear some of those. <laughs> but um, we'll, uh, we'll hit that one at the end. Let's go ahead and answer the question after the interview. Stay tuned and we'll hear lots of versions of thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for me, working in a collaborative uh, venue is most important. And so what I've done in this community since I've been here is find ways to bring people together to work on different projects. And it's projects that I'm passionate about. And it's projects that um, that I think will make a difference. And not only is it important to bring people together to work collaborative um, uh, as a group, but reaching across 
the gender, mm. reaching across the race bias, reaching in cr across the religious, mm. reaching across politics, reaching across <laughs> um, various um, aisles that we use to divide one another because I came from a community that was divided by blacks on one side and whites on the other. And so is what can I do to bring people together to work for a common good that reaches across those aisles? And, uh, you know, if I look at the last 35 years that I've been here, um, I have been extremely, um, I don't use the word blessed that often, but I'll use the word blessed. I have been extremely blessed in terms of people saying yes when asked to come and participate in um, a, a small idea that I have. And by engaging and asking people to come and participate, it becomes a great idea because then you have all of these marvelous thinkers around the idea. Um, so they vary. They vary from organizing the Martin Luther King celebration, which I did that for years. Uh, they vary from... Um, um, working with the Humanities Forum, which is what I do now, sending teachers to rural Alaska to learn about Alaska Native culture so that they can take what they learn and bring it back into the classroom and certainly uh, help with that urban-rural divide because we have that here in Alaska. People who live in rural Alaska, uh, urban Alaska, have their ideas about people who live in rural Alaska. And so this program... Uh, helps us to come together as a state, but as a community. Um, the projects uh, include working with kids um, in thinking about what's possible for their lives. Kids who live, we have an area here called Fairview, and it is rich. It is rich because People may not have as much money as those people who live in other more prosperous parts of the city, but they're rich because um, their parents who have hopes and dreams and aspirations for their, uh, their children's lives as well as their lives, um, and taking uh, kids who live in that community and opening up possibilities for them, and when they are inspired, I am inspired. When they are encouraged, I am encouraged. When they see hope for their lives, then I see hope for their lives. So, it 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 is work that not me surely may, but it's me surely may with an extended community coming to work together mm. yeah. that's good really good points really good points I love that diversity connection well I really do mm -hmm. and it depends on where you're from in the world diversity means something different to you it could be a religious diversity it could be racial it could be socioeconomic like more of a financial issue um, you know it could be gender it, it could be a handicap it, whatever it is for you it's diversity and you about a third of the way into that answer you said something about just the the wisdom that we gain from having a group of people around who are from crazy opposite spectrums and mm -hmm. from very different places because <laughs> i heard somebody say recently we're on we're on a big rock flying through space and we're kind of we're in this thing together you know <laughs> mm -hmm. um I think there's a lot of people volunteering to, to get off right now and go on the space explorations and live in Mars, but, you know. Not yet. Other than that, there's not many ways to get out, so you may as well learn how to do it together. Hmm. Great example. Great example.
Thank you. So, Shirley, question five is, how, how would you tell me to begin sharing hope and, and learning how to share hope with my neighborhood, my community, or, or with myself if I just need it? What are the simple steps I need to start taking? I think you start with a hello. It's that simple. You know, I see people, and the, whether they make eye contact with me, I do, don't make eye contact with me, uh, I'll often say hello. The best way to share hope uh, that I know of is through music. Because music is the 18 inches from the head to the heart. And music goes directly to the heart. And we are all connected. Uh, with the sound, the vibration that comes from my body to your body and yours to mine when we're sharing music. The other way, I think, and we are so removed from this, is by reaching out and touching somebody. You know, a simple handshake, a simple pat on the back, a simple, you know, some kind of human connection. You know, um, I was in a school, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, I was recruiting, and the principal was doing a um, in-service on how not to touch the kids, because if you touch the kids, you're going to get in trouble. And today, I was at a school working with little kindergartners, and I, I needed them to move in this formation, and so I just touched. And they were going, <laughs> and I'm thinking, that's such a basic need that we all have, is to be touched, to be recognized uh, through touch, to be recognized through a glance, to be recognized through um, um, just reaching out to each other, you know, and I said music, I said hello, and I said touch. Great answer. Yeah. Excellent answer. You know, there's a lot of research that, that I keep seeing and keep running into about how important that touch for kids is and, and adults, mm -hmm. but the differences in in elderly and nursing facilities who, who receive touch and have family around versus the ones that are all by themselves. Uh, the, the depression and the, the pattern of their illnesses and even, the, um, even in infants and young children, obviously we've all heard those stories and seen the research there about how many more end up in tragic lifestyles when there's no touch or they've been in an orphanage for, you know, for the first two years of their life and never really handled. Mm -hmm. Great, great advice. So, Shirley, how can we get in touch with you if people want to know more about what you're doing and, and um, maybe have a question or two for you? How can they find you? They can find me on my Facebook, and it's Shirley May Staten, S-T-A-T-E-N. Excellent. That's great. We'll definitely be in touch. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Shirley, tell us thank you in a bunch of different languages. That's an important thing to you, so rattle off. Tell us what language it is and fire away. Okay, in Ghanaian, it is Madasi pa 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 pa. In Vietnamese, it is Kamang. In Russian, it is Spasiba Boshoi. In Spanish, it is Gracias. In German, it is Dankeschön. And I'm trying to think of some other French, Merci beaucoup. I'm trying to think of some of the other countries I've been to that I, oh, uh, I know it in Samoan. I can't remember. Have you been to all those countries? Yeah. Where's the next country? 
Uh, maybe, oh, for my 70th birthday, we're going to Italy. No kidding. Uh, next Italy. Year. Yeah. Favorite piece of music, if you want to feel more hopeful. What? What is it? Oh, my favorite piece of music. Um, it's something from my mother, and it would be, I found the answer, I've learned to pray, with faith to guide me, I found my way. The sun is shining on me each day. I found the answer. I've learned to pray. You've just listened to I Share Hope. If you're ready to make a change, head to our website at ishareHope.com and claim your free copy of the top 10 actions of hope from world leaders to use hope in your own life. Thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Yeah, it's, if you've never seen Snowy Mountains, it's, it's like, um, it's like what you see in a movie, and, and it's just perfect and white and black little spots all over them, and they're just white, white and black, perfect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, and this beautiful blue skies up here in the clouds. I mean, it's just, it's perfect, you know? And cold. Actually, it's warm right now. It's springtime. It's not cold. Cold in Fairbanks. Yeah, it gets cold here, too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. Question number one for you, then. Give me a definition of hope. So how would you define hope, or what... What is your understanding of hope in your life? Leaders share their real stories of hope and how you can use actionable hope to start changing your life today. And now, here's your host, Chris Williams. So, Shirley May Springer State from, well, not from Alaska. No. You're a transplant. Yes. So I want to know, in a minute I want to know where, tell me now, where are you from originally and what are you doing in Alaska now? I was born in New York, in Harlem. I was raised by my grandmother in rural Georgia. I have been in Alaska. I actually started coming to Alaska in 1979. I was living in Los Angeles at the time. And I would come to uh, Fairbanks in the summer. And then uh, summer of 1980, I decided I would come to Fairbanks, go back to L.A., come to Fairbanks. I did that twice. And then in 1981, I decided to come to Anchorage, and I actually fell in love flying over the mountains. And I knew that I wanted to be here. So I've been here since... uh, in Anchorage since 1979. I just flew over those mountains a few hours ago. And it's, it's gorgeous. Unbelievable. I know, I know. Hope is feeling joyful about your life. Hope is feeling inspired and encouraged about your life. And not only my life, but the people who are in my life. Um, when I wake up in the morning and I am able to take breath, I am joyful because the other option is not taking breath. And the best way to share hope uh, that I know of is through music because music is the 18 inches from the head to the heart. And music goes directly to the heart. I'm Shirley May Springer Staten in Anchorage, Alaska, and I share hope. Welcome to I Share Hope, the podcast where world